Let's get cooking and spice up your favorite games. Get to iHeartland, where gaming and entertainment unite for another epic event on Roblox. Wells Adams and Tyler Florence of Two Dudes in a Kitchen will be there with the spiciest, tastiest new podcast on iHeartRadio. It's all happening in iHeartland at State Farm Park, Thursday, March 23rd at 7 p.m. Eastern. Learn more at iHeartRadio.com slash iHeartLand. Plus, don't forget to ride the Ferris wheel at the State Farm neighborhood for the best views of iHeartLand. Just a heads up, the following episode deals with death, addiction, and mental health. Take care while listening. And if you're a new listener, this is our 10th episode. You probably want to start with episode one. Oh, Danelle, Danelle, Danelle. <laughs> you and I have been leading rather parallel lives, actually. I live in San Francisco. I lost a kid to the rails meaning he wrote them for almost a decade. He, he comes from an intact family. His dad and I have been together forever. DC writer taught him how to drive. It's kind of amazing. We just had, sadly, a very different ending. Anyway, if you'd like to hear my story, give me a call. Take good care. Bye-bye. I didn't think it was possible there was someone living a life parallel to mine, but there was, and she was listening to City of the Rails. Our specifics were different, but I was telling her story, and I was in her neighborhood. Nanette Krupa lives in my hometown, San Francisco, and her son Rooster rode for 10 years until the trains took him in December 2020. I called Nanette as soon as I heard her message. It was like a lifeline to me wrapping up this show trying to tell the story of a family that got bound up with the rails. I'd answered my questions about who, where, and why, but as I was bringing this to a close, I started interrogating my role in all of this. I'd met enough writers to know the kind of teen who ended up on the rails, but was there a type of mom who drove them to leave? I'd talked to a lot of parents over the years, but back then I'd been asking different questions. So four days after her phone message, I was on my way to meet Nanette. I wanted her to help me figure out if I'd done something that pushed Ruby out onto the rails. Because if that was possible, if there was something I'd done, I knew what it had to be. I'm Danelle Morton, and this is City of the Rails. relate to everything you're talking about. It's so interesting that you've embraced feeling everything that they're going through in a way that's open and honest, and I try to do that, too. Nanette lives in the foggiest part of San Francisco, the Avenues, not far from where I went to high school. I found her in a modest gray house with a big front porch, and it was protected by her son Rooster's dog, Nikita Khrushchev a sleek black hunting dog who used to ride trains with Rooster. And when I settled in on Nanette's couch, Nikita would not leave me alone. She was right at my side, her big eyes looking up at me from my lap and talking over Nanette as she shouted from the kitchen. Yeah, you want calf or decaf? Decaf would be good because it's past noon. Um, I was instantly at ease here in this comfy living room, Nanette in her favorite chair. A lot had happened in these rooms before Rooster left and I felt his absence. Nanette and her husband, Bob, had raised Maxwell, Rooster's given name, and his younger sister, Alex, in this home. While we spoke, Nanette kept pointing to Rooster's old bedroom, just off the living room, and it was clear Nikita knew what was going on. There aren't too many of us trained moms, but when we get together, we get right to the point. So like the ride-or-die hobo crews that hop trains as a pack, or the engineer and the conductor duos chugging through the deserts at night, Nanette and I were about to become a family at least for this afternoon. Nanette said that Rooster was fascinated by trains long before he rode them. He just loved everything about them. 
Goodness gracious. She's so chatty today, Bob, and she just won't leave Danelle alone. That's my girlfriend. He, she knows we're talking about him. Mm -hmm. So did you do what I did? Did you start looking into what the world of the trains was? No, I did not. If it had been my daughter, possibly. Oh, I was geez. almost like knowing less is better. <laughs> I didn't want all the details. I knew that when he'd come home, he'd tell me everything. Wow, that'd be a change of pace for me and Ruby. But it was different for Nanette. When Rooster came home for Christmas, he was a homebody. I made sure he had fresh sheets. I made him his favorite food, which were my buffalo wings and Greek salad. And, um, you know, he would sneak off to 7-Eleven and get a 40 and we would watch Last Week Tonight with John Oliver, like all of them, all of Silicon Valley, all the TV. We had so much fun. Rooster also fit the profile I'd been developing of the dirty kid who came from a middle-class home. He was smart, sensitive, and likely had a learning disability. And all the energy around those qualities goes haywire when these kids hit the teenage years. That exquisite sensitivity, usually artistic too, makes the crush of high school social life excruciating. And the learning disability is isolating. A lot of them start life sociable, but in high school, kids like Rooster become loners. As they withdraw from the world, frantic parents send them to psychiatrists, get them on drugs like Prozac and anti-anxiety medication. That's how it was with Rooster, too. He was an odd combination of stir up the shit and, and anxiety. He was neurodivergent, ADHD, fun, fun, fun. That kid was so active and such a blast. But Rooster was extremely anxious. But he was fearful of change and things he didn't know. It took a really long time to get him to ride a bike. It took a really long time to get him to swim. I wouldn't say he was popular with his peers. He liked to push people until he pissed them off. There was something entertaining for him about doing that. Mm -hmm. And that's why he had issues with his peers. And Rooster was a sleepwalker. The door to his bedroom opens into the living room. Nanette is a night owl, watches TV late. Starting when he was a little boy, several times a week, Rooster would get out of bed, walk into the living room, and just stand there. But he had a lot of problems turning off the brain at night. And when he drank a certain amount, then the sleepwalking kicked in. Rooster's teenage years were lonely. So Nanette was happy when a new kid, slightly older, moved into the neighborhood. But then he and Rooster started drinking together, and Rooster escalated to hard drugs. His senior year, he was less and less interested in school. Rooster dropped out a few months before graduation and got his GED. We were in therapy. We were in family therapy. He was in um, outpatient rehab. He spent two months at inpatient rehab. We went through the whole thing. Nanette pointed to the door to Rooster's room. Crack cocaine. In your house? No. No, he would use in the tenderloin and then come home and be in there sleeping for 36 hours. I knew the exact feeling, having a troubled teen living in close quarters, seeing the closed bedroom door right there, wondering if you dare open it or when to barge in, ready for a confrontation. That's where it feels like a rebuke of you as a parent, of what you've been trying to offer. As Rooster's addiction got worse, Nanette and Bob kicked him out of the house. This was a turning point for them. And as my mother said, he will be attracted to the lowest common denominator because they will accept him wholeheartedly. Mm -hmm. And finally I said, look, you have to stick to the rules. You have to um, go to work every day. You have to take care of yourself, and you can't use. I don't even care if you smoke pot. I don't even care if you drink a few beers. But you may not do drugs and stay here. That's the rules. And we had a first incident, a second incident, a third. By incident 10, I said, okay, this is it. And I threw him out. So it was really tough. And as you can tell, we're in a 1,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it took a real toll on all the other family members. It was really hard to live with. 
Nanette tortured herself over this decision, fearing she was sending Rooster out to his death on the streets of San Francisco. But Rooster didn't like the Tenderloin either. After living on the streets for a while, he found his way to Santa Cruz, where he met a lot of train hoppers. And it wasn't long before he was on the rails. Calls me and says, guess what? I'm on a freight train. I said, you're kidding me. He's like, yeah, I'm, I'm loving it. I'm having the time of my life. I'm like, are you using? No. Because you can't be high on a train. You will die. I'd heard this all the time, that riders with anxiety disorders discovered an eerie calm, a heightened focus, when they were hopping trains. The situation they'd thrown themselves into was so dangerous and demanding, their anxiety for a while seemed to disappear. I knew his anxiety would keep him safe. I knew because of his anxiety that he was going to know every single thing that he had to know to be safe on these trains. When kids leave middle-class homes for the rails, one of the first things they do is throw away the Prozac, anti-anxiety medication, Lexapro, and whatever mood stabilizers their child psychiatrist put them on, even if it's drugs for schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. The new travelers want to feel it all and not be lulled into complacency by pharmaceuticals. So instead, they self-medicate with alcohol and drugs, sometimes heroin. They want to feel it all on their own terms, even if it might kill them. And when Nanette told me we'd led parallel lives, she wasn't kidding. Rooster became such an experienced hobo, he learned about how C.C. Ryder offered travelers a place to stay in Haver, Montana. He ended up staying with C.C. three or four times a year. They developed a strong friendship. I called C.C. to ask her about Rooster. He always makes an excellent impression on me. Because he just was a genuine dude, man. I mean, genuine as genuine can be. And as it turns out, C.C. Ryder taught Rooster how to drive. And C.C. told me he had no choice. It was to save her from a DUI. As they left a bar near C.C.'s house, she threw Rooster the keys to her car. Well, we went to the bar and I got messed up. I said, sorry, bro, but you got to drive. He says, I don't know how to drive. I said, you're going to learn. He yeah. was kind of wobbly in the beginning. Well, the, the bar is only across the tracks on the north side. You know, we're like a mile and a half away, so he didn't have to go far. But Cece wanted to know something from me. How's Nikita? The dog was going, oh! (laughs) Funny, she was telling you stories. I knew she was, from the intense way Nikita looked at me when she was howling. I wondered what those stories would be, as Nikita was not your typical road dog. Now, Now everybody says she hated train hopping, well, when I'd take him to catch out, she'd get all giddy and hit and start shaking real bad. Like, oh, no, not again. Yeah. She didn't even like driving in my car. Nikita hated train hopping so much, Rooster had to stop traveling with her, which is how the dog ended up with Nanette and Bob, while Rooster kept riding. Nanette had simple rules for Rooster when he was on the rails. You had to come home for Christmas. And if I called you, you had to return the call or text me why you couldn't return the call. Or So Christmas 2020, Rooster was on his way home from Yuma when Nanette told him he had to find a way to quarantine for 10 days. She just had COVID pretty bad. So Rooster hung around in Yuma and hopped a train out of Tucson. Max decided to take the coastline back up to Roseville and then the Amtrak from Roseville. He'd have enough time that he could come back and see us because he really, really missed Nikita and he missed us. Nanette and Bob expected him home by New Year's. But late one night after Christmas, Bob woke up to a firm knock at the door. Bob went and looked out and he goes, it's the police. And I went, oh my God, it's probably Max. And I'm calling his cell phone. I leave Max a message. What are you doing now? What's going on now? Jeez. And I hang up. And they just told me, we, we found him dead on the, on the side of the uh, railroad track. And that was it. And Bob comes in and he said, Max is dead. And I screamed for about three minutes. Just screamed. It was the most awful feeling in the world. And Bob 
and I were just, we just hugged. Nanette believes Rooster was sleepwalking when he got up from his sleeping bag and walked off the side of the boxcar. And he was never suicidal. He never had a death wish, ever. He loved life. Nanette and her sister went to Yuma to collect the body and to speak to the sheriff. So the train was going very, very fast, 65 to 70 miles an hour. And he said, walking off of that, he felt no pain. And they went to see where Rooster spent that last Christmas and meet his friends. They were so sweet. They were so kind. And they said, do you want to see the hop out? Do you want to see where he lived? Yes. So I went and met them. I gave them $50. They didn't want to take it. I said, you'll take it. They gave me two bottles he had decorated at Christmas. Nanette brought out the bottles for me to see. This was their little great gift to us. She showed me two tequila bottles hand-painted with blue symbols and Christmas greetings. It was a quiet moment in a room that had been filled with conversation for more than two hours. And this was my moment to ask. Did Nanette pour over the past, asking herself if there was anything else she could have done? I tried everything I possibly could think of. So I didn't think I did something wrong. I thought I didn't do enough. Mm -hmm. And what else could I have done? Like Nanette, I've asked myself that. But today, Nanette has peace because she has nights when she feels she can still speak to her son, and he soothes her. So people ask me all the time, how do you live with this? First of all, I'm really, really lucky because I can kind of break through the veil a little bit. I've seen evidence of souls after they've left bodies and before they've come into them. And I'm sitting right there about five hours later and I'm crying and I'm like Max what were you thinking in my head instantly the voice comes through are you kidding it was epic it was fantastic it was a perfect way to die Nanette's feeling of connection through the veil gave her a sense of mystical peace I'm not someone who pierces the veil. I don't even believe it exists, but sometimes I wish I did. I recognize what a comfort it would be to connect to the people who are gone. And that last sentence stayed with me long after I left Nanette. It was a perfect way to die. Living with so much risk gives hobos an acute sense of life and death. We all know our lives could end at any minute, but hobos see that daily. And for them, it's all part of the ride. You can hear it in the chorus of Profane Sass's song about the squat fire, 1228. It is deep with sadness, but it's also a fond send-off. You were loved, you are missed but you are a rare person who lived as they chose and raised their middle finger to the consequences. Yeah, but you shouldn't cry. No tears, no tears. Tears are a waterfall. Say something funny about that person and play their favorite song. Carry on. Carry on. Do something in their name. I was thinking about this as I made my way home from Nanette, Bob, and Nikita. I wanted to make sense of my own maternal response, and I got what I came for. With Nanette, I realized there was no maternal playbook for a child who just wanted to be free. The rejection of the conventional world is at the heart of every person who takes to the rails. But had I done something to make our side of the tracks even less appealing to Ruby? Nanette struggled with the decision to kick Rooster out after he'd been using so heavily. And right when things were on the brink with Ruby, I had done something I was beginning to question. And the worst part about it was, I did it to protect her. After Ruby attempted suicide, I went to visit her in a mental institution where she was under a 72-hour hold. 
She was still high from all the drugs in her system. We held hands across a narrow formica table, the edges worn down from the thousands of elbows that had rested there as concerned families dealt with their crises. I asked her if ending up here was a significant enough shock that she wouldn't do this again. She thought about it for a minute. Then she said she'd probably stick it out for a month or two, but she would try this again. When I left the hospital, I knew I couldn't bring her home. I couldn't guarantee that I'd be able to keep her safe. As I sat in our empty apartment in Santa Monica, I had no idea what to do, but I had to do something. Hey, I'm Lance Bass, host of the new iHeart podcast, Frosted Tips with Lance Bass. The hardest thing can be knowing who to turn to when questions arise or times get tough or you're at the end of the road. Ah, okay, I see what you're doing. Do you ever think to yourself, what advice would Lance Bass and my favorite boy bands give me in this situation? If you do, you've come to the right place because I'm here to help. This I promise you. Oh, God. Seriously, I swear. And you won't have to send an SOS because I'll be there for you. Oh, man. And so my husband, Michael. Um, hey, that's me. Yep, we know that, Michael. And a different hot, sexy teen crush boy bander each week to guide you through life step by step. Oh, not another one. Mm-hmm. Kids, relationships, life in general can get messy. You may be thinking, this is the story of my life. Oh, just stop now. If so, tell everybody, yeah, everybody about my new podcast and make sure to listen so we'll never ever have to say bye bye bye. Listen to Frosted Tips with Lance Bass on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. When Ruby was hospitalized, I consulted with her psychiatrist, who suggested we send her off to an emotional growth boarding school. I'd never heard of a place like that, but it was only 24 hours later when I was up on Big Bear Mountain, three hours east of Santa Monica, a place where frantic parents send their teenagers. And I was frantic. Like so many parents, I figured this was the best place to send my daughter, since I didn't know how to keep her safe. Little did I know, this was not just any boarding school. It was the worst one, Sea-Doo, a place that traumatized hundreds of kids, although I didn't know about that at the time. The sea campus looked like a happy summer camp from the outside, with tennis courts and a swimming pool. Amenities that did a pretty good job of hiding from distraught parents what was taking place in the sweet little Swiss chalet-looking dorms. The program was rigorous, with lots of group therapy and individual therapy for an added fee. In the daily group sessions, guided by their counselors, they confronted the issues in their lives, the things that led their parents to send them away. This sounded good to me, as well as intensive sessions called profits, where they would focus on a single idea for days, like, I want to live. Another thing that sounded like it might benefit young people who had considered or attempted suicide. I only found out later how brutal these sessions were for the teens. When I had my weekly call with Ruby, she couldn't speak freely on the phone. Staff monitored the calls, and students could be reprimanded or even isolated if they complained to their parents too much. And if I got emotional about something Ruby told me, I'd later get an email or a phone call from her counselor about trusting the process and supporting the staff. From what I heard from her counselors, Ruby was doing well, getting more and more privileges. And as the months went on, we had longer visits, starting with one on campus, and then a weekend away at a hotel on the mountain. At every visit, I was anxious to see how she was doing, and I braced myself. The second she got in the car with me, she complained about all the things they were doing to her and her friends. It was a long list about everything from the food to complaints about individual counselors. I know for sure I wasn't fully grasping what was going on. What I retained was she hated being away and wanted to come home. I wanted that too, but it was too soon. So I just let her vent, but I missed her desperately. Every day I wondered when would be the right moment to bring her back and what situation would be right for her return. I'd moved home to the Bay Area after I sold the single mom effect thinking whenever Ruby got out of that place, this would be a good place for a fresh start. And then suddenly, there was an urgency to solve that problem right away. She'd been there nearly a year when Sidu discovered that Ruby had a crush on one of the male students, and the two of them had been leaving notes for each other in their cubbies. This is strictly forbidden, 
and both of them had to be punished. They were both put on something called bans, which meant they were not allowed to speak to anyone, had to sit alone at the dining hall, and were not allowed to make eye contact or smile. How was this helping them, this being shunned for a normal teenage response? That would just piss them off more, make them more defiant. When I called the staff to get a full explanation of what bans meant, I said I wanted this stopped. But unbeknownst to me, they escalated. They told Ruby that if she kept breaking the rules like this, she'd end up as a single mom with no employable skills outside of manual labor and decided to introduce her to what that life would feel like. They assigned her to scrub the bathroom on her hands and knees and gave her an animatronic baby to take care of. The baby was set to cry a few times an hour. Ruby would have to stop to soothe the crying baby, then go back to work. When I found out what they were doing, I was furious at the way they were humiliating her. How would this motivate her to change? And certainly this was not the single mom Ruby was raised by, or the single moms I was writing about in my book. This archaic sexist crap as a punishment? I blew my stack on the phone with the office and demanded that they stop, but the punishment was already over. When I got the full story, it turned out Ruby was as pissed off as I expected. The baby wouldn't stop crying, so in frustration, Ruby gave it a shake, and it died. The staff had already forced Ruby to conduct a funeral for the robot baby, with all the other students standing at the grave the so-called father had dug for the burial. How was this supposed to make Ruby think life was worth living? Barbaric, her father and I agreed. We needed to get her out of there. But it wasn't as easy as just pulling her out. We needed to have the right school to place her in so she had the best chance of success when she came home. And while we were exploring options, Sidu went bankrupt. I got a call on a Thursday afternoon ordering me to come pick up Ruby within 24 hours as the place was shutting down. Ruby was on spring vacation with her father. When I got through to them, they were on their way back to the campus. She was elated that this would be the last time she saw Sidu. When her father and she pulled up to that place, it was like Lord of the Flies on the mountaintop. The staff had split. They hadn't been paid in weeks leaving the kids to manage themselves. They'd broken into the commissary and were gorging on candy. Some of them were having sex in the bushes. Ruby grabbed her stuff and she and her father split. A few hours later, I picked her up at the Oakland airport, both of us in shock. Ruby sat in my unfamiliar living room, blinking like a newborn, happy to be out, but unsure, as both of us were, what would come next. Eventually, we found a school that was perfect for her small and with strong academics. As her friends changed from schoolmates to train hoppers and musicians, she started to confront me about Sidu. You sent me away, she'd say bitterly. I wasn't impressed by her anger then. I dismissed it saying, and you're alive to tell me I suck, so I'm okay with that. At the time I'd been desperate. I thought this was at least one place I could guarantee she'd be safe. But all these years later, after all I'd learned and come to appreciate about the uniqueness of Ruby and the people she chose when she left to hop trains, I was ashamed I was so dismissive of her pain. My shame came to a peak the day Ruby made an appointment with me to talk about Sea-Doo. It was January of 2021, when Paris Hilton was lobbying on Capitol Hill, trying to get Congress to regulate emotional growth boarding schools, establish some standards for the staff, and put some limits on what they could do to the children under their control. CDU forced us to participate in attack therapy designed to humiliate and degrade you. At CDU, I was not allowed to speak to or look at my peers. The staff verbally abused me, calling me vulgar names that should never be said to a child. I did not comply with the program, so I was brought to Ascent in Idaho. I knew about Ascent a wilderness program the staff often threatened to send the kids to if they didn't follow the Sea-Doo program. There are many of these places where the selling point is that your child needs to be shocked, scared into complying with the rules. Ruby never ended up at Ascent, but when Paris said those bold things about her experience at sea I had an idea of what Ruby would want to talk about. Before our conversation, I took down my journals. I've kept a journal for nearly 30 years. I paged through looking for every time I mentioned sea to prepare for whatever issues Ruby wanted to raise about that time. I didn't want to be defensive, as I'd lost any need to defend what I'd done. 
I knew more about this now, and I could apologize. But I wouldn't apologize for trying to keep her alive. Sometimes as a parent, the only choices you have are bad ones. I had failed in a way, though, and I knew it. Yes, she was alive, but she hadn't been safe. We talked for nearly two hours, and we cried. Ruby had no idea that her father and I were trying to get her out months before the place closed down. She thought we were just going to leave her there forever and didn't care how she was being treated. As a parent, it's hard to know which of the many complaints to take seriously. Ruby had told us so much about it every time we got her away for a visit, but I didn't appreciate just how terrible it had been for her. We forgave each other for all of it, what led up to it, what happened while she was there, and how it ended. But after Nanette and I spoke, the weight of that time, my sarcastic dismissal, felt heavy on me. In sending her away to that awful place, I had broken some fundamental link in our family life, some basic trust between us. In that time before her suicide attempt, Ruby was sensitive to the hypocrisy of the adult world, the bullshit of everyday life, and the stupid bargains we make to appear respectable when we are withering inside. But when I sent Ruby away, it was like I'd cast her out of the family, and in a way I was shaming her more than the funeral for the robot baby. Suddenly family was part of the bullshit too. I'd made it a lot easier for her to reject family along with everything else. When she ditched us at graduation, it was an echo of what I'd done to her, sending her away without warning. I am at the stage of life when regrets hit hard, and after all I'd learned exploring the city of the rails, I had to own up to this decision being one of the biggest regrets of my motherhood. I don't know what else I could have done, but I am sorry that I sent her off to see do. Well, I'm still stuck on this. Ruby just wants me to move on, get over it. She certainly moved on. When I told her I was doing a podcast where I would blend the story of what she went through on the rails with my decade of research, she was exasperated with me and then enraged. She gave me three instructions. Change her name, talk about her suicide attempt, and talk about sending her off to see do I wasn't going to talk about those things at all. I felt like those parts of the story were hers to tell. Plus, she didn't want to give me any guidance on how to address them. We have forgiven each other, but those scars remain. There isn't a family I know of that doesn't struggle through, scars and all, and work toward a future founded on the fact that love endures, love survives. That foundation is something we can return to once we've said what we need to say about the past and been humbled by that. And I know the fact that I have not been able to let loose of the railroad and have kept plunging deeper and deeper in long after Ruby left has not been helpful to this healing. It's the problem of being the child of a writer. I have told this story about her, but it's not her story. I think I'm getting why she never answered any of my questions. She wants to keep that story as her own, and she's gone some length to protect it. And one thing I've come to understand during my time in the city of the rails is that no matter if you are tough, smart, or just stubborn, and even if you do everything right, the rails break your heart. Coming up against their brutal power reveals things in you and in others. Sometimes those are things you'd rather not see, rather look away. So many people die out there, so many lives are lost to the trains, and riders carry those losses with them, even after leaving the rails. Once riders do get off the rails, it's hard for them to figure out how to live a good life, and it can be difficult to fit back into the world they left behind. Ruby had to figure that out, too. I was worried at first that Ruby wouldn't find much meaning in life back home, but I didn't need to. She has made a life of her own, something to be very proud of, using what she learned on the rails to make a positive impact in the community. Getting off the rails, the people who make that transition the best are ones who did what Ruby did. They find a way to support themselves while holding conventional society at arm's length. That's what Kiwi from Profane Sass did, too. We have to get through the, the maze of dogs. A few years ago, she and her partner Daniel got a permit to start a weed farm in Oklahoma, a way for them to sustain a life off the rails. Their farm is well organized with rows and rows of plants ready to harvest. Right now we have three rows of cannabis and 
They are all in flower. So we're about four weeks away from a harvest. And this will be our third harvest in this greenhouse this year. Oh, that's very productive. Yeah, we're trying our hardest. <laughs> Kiwi, who was the banjo player for Profane Sass, the band that performs our theme music, Wayfaring Stranger, has been off the rails for more than a decade. What got Kiwi off the rails was a tragedy. After the squat fire in New Orleans, Profane Sass was devastated. they just lost eight of their friends. And then nine months later, Tomas, the lead singer of Profane Sass, died on the rails while he was taking some kids on their first ride. He was their charismatic barefoot mandolin player, who everyone called Toe. When he passed, Kiwi needed to get off for a while. Right after Toe died, I was like, I don't know what I'm doing with my life. I mean, the reason I even got into cannabis is it was basically how I healed myself from my best friend dying. <laughs> so I really love, you know, the peace that comes with farming. We were supposed to go be rock stars and have, you know, we had big plans. Um, but after he died, you know, we all had to lick our wounds. <laughs> That death shook Kiwi and everyone else from Profane Sass. Tomas was in a lot of ways the heart of their music, a big man with a powerful voice and personality whose death affects her to this day. I don't think I can talk, I don't wanna go play music on the street, I'm heartbroken. <laughs> and I got a job offer uh, in that spring to like just live on a mountain and grow weed, which is perfect. I'm like, this is amazing, yeah, I just, need to go cry in a greenhouse for a year. Uh, but it also led to this new career path, I guess you can say. So accidentally becoming a weed farmer. There's a lot of things about her new life Kiwi didn't expect. She grew up in Reno, never thinking she'd end up in Oklahoma, and as a farmer, no less. Seems like she and Daniel have a knack for this accidental career. The greenhouse is lush, jungle-like with all the plants about to be harvested. But yeah, so now we're in the middle of the greenhouse and we're like surrounded by five foot tall plants, which is about as big as we want them in the greenhouses. Um, and it probably smells really strong. <laughs> I can't even smell weed anymore. It's definitely a lot of labor. There's only two of us, so. Whoa. We do all the farming, everything. But, uh, do you guys have to do your own trimming as well? Uh, we do some and then we hire some friends. We still have some friends that are like still touring musicians that come trim for us and make some extra dough because we all know music doesn't pay well. We also have some like babies in their 20s and they're like riding trains now and doing the cool stuff that I used to do. Going to New Orleans, playing on the street and busking and uh, they come and trim for us. Kiwi started this business when she was trimming weed in California. Now she hires people off the rails to help the farm at harvest season. A full circle, giving back to where she and Daniel came from. This attitude of welcoming people from the traveling community reminded me a lot of C.C. Ryder, living by the tracks. And on top of employing her hobo friends on her organic weed farm, Kiwi opens her home to all kinds of strays. We were part of a dog rescue, or there's like a lot of stray dogs and we're trying to like clean them up and get them into nice families. Two are like retired train riding dogs. <laughs> They're old. You think they missed the train? <laughs> Maybe a little bit, but my dog, she's almost 16 and I got her when I was 16. So she's definitely in retirement these days. Kiwi's found a way to live a full life off the rails, on her own terms. But Kiwi still thinks about them. So when did you stop writing? I wouldn't say I stopped. I'll go <laughs> hop a train, but I just have no time. <laughs> I'm busy right now. <laughs> but uh, I've put all my eggs in this basket. But, you know, if it all fails, I can go back to living under a bridge and hopping trains. <laughs> It's always <laughs> the back plan. Right. There's always plan B. Yeah. Yeah, my partner, he's also an old train rider, so, you know, if it all fails, it's all good. I think there's, there's a type of person that's just like, 
there's always somewhere else to go. I look at the trains every day. I'm like, oh yeah, I could just hop on that and be out of here. No matter how long or short of a time you've been on the rails, it seems, there's always a draw to go back. That feeling that when you're at a low point in life, escape is just a few feet from this side of the tracks. I saw this with Lee, sleeping under his truck in the California desert, mining for precious metals. And I heard it from Thomas Wolfe, too, from episode four, even though he's been off the rails for 10 years. Well, when my daughter asked me about it, I explained to her that it was the sound, you know, the, the smells, the creosote, the, uh, the whistles. Was a bit, even now, even now when train whistles go off, sometimes people I work with yell, hold him down, hold him down. That pull of the rails is something people just can't shake. I was drawn into this world by Ruby, but at this point, I'm in too deep. And thankfully, the story I moved on to next has nothing to do with Ruby. It's all about another world I discovered inside the city of the rails. Hey, I'm Lance Bass, host of the new iHeart podcast, Frosted Tips with Lance Bass. The hardest thing can be knowing who to turn to when questions arise or times get tough or you're at the end of the road. Ah, okay, I see what you're doing. Do you ever think to yourself, what advice would Lance Bass and my favorite boy bands give me in this situation? If you do, you've come to the right place because I'm here to help. This I promise you. Oh, God. Seriously, I swear. And you won't have to send an SOS because I'll be there for you. Oh, man. And so my husband, Michael. Um, hey, that's me. Yep, we know that, Michael. And a different hot, sexy teen crush boy bander each week to guide you through life step by step. Oh, not another one. Mm-hmm. Kids, relationships, life in general can get messy. You may be thinking, this is the story of my life. Oh, just stop now. If so, tell everybody, yeah, everybody about my new podcast and make sure to listen so we'll never ever have to say bye bye bye. Listen to Frosted Tips with Lance Bass on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. I started out this journey trying to tell the story of my daughter going on to the rails. But when she came home, as the years piled up, my fascination was less about her and more about the unforgettable people, the history, and the culture in the city of the rails. When Ruby first left, I was seeking the romance and the beauty. Well, you know that clack, clack, clack on the railroad tracks? It's called the Hobo's Lullaby. And looking down and just completely surrounded by pink water, just feeling outside of this world. But beyond that was the intrigue and the mystery. There is another world out there and it's dark. I'm gonna go head first into the darkness. So I don't have to do what you do. And history, too, how the railroads created modern America. Because it's behind the scenes, you have the finger on the pulse of the nation. The railroads show you how to raise capital, set up management, and also they show you how to cheat. The more I learned, the more I came to see the train yard as the last lawless place. We're bulls. We're in control. He comes running up, sees the dude has my sign, and he fucking punches him. For all the beauty and community, the rails are brutal. Nobody treats other human beings in the way that we are being treated unless they actually hate us. It says, this is for the dogs, so they can eat, not for you, and walks off. But even if they are treated roughly and with disrespect, they'd made a conscious choice to embrace this life, and they didn't want anyone to pity them. I cherish me. And I know that when I take the west wind, I'm going to be riding high. As I worked my way further into the city of the rails, so many things caught my interest and felt important to pursue. But there was one detour that landed me somewhere I couldn't have imagined when I started chasing after Ruby. In all my time reporting on the trains, there was one guy who kept popping up in every train yard, and that guy was Dirty Mike. You might remember him as the guy who had barbecue supplies stashed in train yards all over the country. I'm like, wow, man, I wonder if this guy's got it like this everywhere, you know? He, you really knew his shit, man. Even if his knowledge of the trains was legendary, no one trusted him. What's up? I'm Dirty Mike, FTRA, King of the Hobos, I think were his first words. So I'm thinking this guy's a goon. The writers never forgot the way Mike strode into the hobo jungle, talking loud so everyone would have to react to him. And everyone knew he was bullshitting them. 
He bragged about being up at the top of the Freight Train Riders of America, supposedly the most violent gang on the rails. Dirty Mike claimed he was the FTRA's hitman, sent out to clean up situations on FTRA territory where another gang was trying to take over. But I also heard from people who liked Mike. Sometimes Mike rescued people, like when he protected Sylvia from being harassed in Colton. And I yelled, Dirty Mike's name, he comes running up. She's the dude has my sign, and he fucking punches him, throws him over the off ramp. He goes flying down the hill. We were friends ever since. I honestly felt like he was constantly lying to me about how many people he had killed and the, these things that he did for the FTRA. And I, I just, I felt like he was a bullshit artist. Hobos had a lot to say about Dirty Mike, and there were a lot of conflicting stories. So who was he, and what was the FTRA? I'd heard about the freight train riders of America when I was getting to know the rail cops. When I met Joe and Larry in El Paso, I asked them about the gang's reputation. The rail cops knew the FTRA was aggressive. This was one gang even the bulls steered clear of. Most of the hobos, they just kept to themselves. These guys would look you straight in the eye and, like, I'm not afraid of you, you know? I didn't even dare search them or, or, or give them a hard time because that's all they needed, something to spark up a fight. The FTRA was founded by disgruntled Vietnam vets, angry that Ronald Reagan cut their veteran benefits. So the FTRA also stands for Fuck the Reagan Administration. So when Joe knew the FTRA were in the yard, he avoided them. There's this gang. You got to be careful with these because these guys, they have these challenges of shooting security and, and uh, rebel police. He goes, actually, you can look inside a, a train and they'll shoot you in the face. Everybody knew, everybody stayed away from those guys, you know? And then they had their camp. Like that hobo jungle were clear for them. Nobody wanted to be associated with them. Throughout my reporting, I kept wondering who really ran the train yard. And it seemed like the answer might be the FTRA, which is exactly why I figured they could help me. After Ruby came home, I started investigating the rail cops and even got a couple of journalism grants to support me. And at this point in the show, it should be no surprise, I had a tough time finding sources. So I figured if I could get one of these old FTRA guys to talk to me, he could tell me a lot about the rail cops. The FTRA knew every train yard in America had a lot of run-ins with rail cops and no reason to protect them. Dirty Mike, other writers told me, knew a few of the bulls by name, and they'd seen him greeting them like old friends. He just might be the key to unlocking the story of the rail cops. So I kept Googling Dirty Mike and the FTRA. And then one day, there was a be on the lookout bulletin for Dirty Mike. We are now going to turn to the urgent manhunt for a Texas man who went on the run the night before. The bulletin listed his name as Michael Elijah Thompson and had a lot of aliases beyond Dirty Mike, Little Bear, Crazy Mike, and Nasty Mike. And the first time I met Larry Diaz, he told me he'd seen Dirty Mike around. I, I knew him because I saw him here and there, would run into him on multiple occasions in different areas. He knew who I was better than I knew who he was. I just clumped them together as part of that group, mm -hmm. FTRA group. You need to be careful with them and, you know, they don't give a mad fuck kind of attitude. Larry didn't suspect Dirty Mike was a murderer any more than the hobos did. But after the Crime Stoppers Bulletin, word got around in the traveling community that maybe Dirty Mike hadn't been exaggerating. Maybe he was a murderer. I never paid any attention to it until we, me and Chad got pulled off of a train in El Paso and the bull asked us if we knew and dude named Mike with railroad tracks tattooed by his eye and that he was wanted for murder. Straight away, me and Chad were like, oh crap, he's talking about Dirty Mike. And we we're like, yeah, we do know that person. And he's like, do you know where he is? And we said, no. We have no idea, you know, we haven't seen him since Colton, which was probably about two or three months before that. So all of a sudden, the police were looking for Dirty Mike. How many years had he been on the rails? How many people had he killed and gotten away with it? After all, Dirty Mike could kill someone, hop a train, and be four states away before anyone discovered the body. So suddenly I was very interested in Dirty Mike and what he could tell me about the rails that no one else could. It was June when I found out Dirty Mike had been arrested in Vancouver, Washington and extradited to Placer County for a murder outside the Roseville train yard back in 2000. 
So I'm navigating us to the Roseville Market, which has kind of always been my getting dropped off point. Police had discovered the body near the Roseville Market, where Zoe and I stopped before my oogle attempt to hop a train. It's like a little convenience store? Mm Mm-hmm, yeah. Yeah, It's pretty much like this is the closest place to get water, food, cigarettes, beer. Yeah. That's where Judy Mike allegedly stashed the body of John Semler Owens. El Paso and Roseville. Now there were two murders and counting. So I decided to go visit Dirty Mike so we could have a little chat about the rail cops. I checked the prison website for visiting hours and made my way up to the Placer County Jail on Thursday summer afternoon. Dirty Mike had no idea I was coming and he might refuse my visit, as was his right. But what did I have to lose? At the jail, I filled in a form listing myself as his friend and watched while the officer did a quick background check. He handed me number 17, the seat where Dirty Mike and I would be face to face with just bulletproof glass separating us. In the waiting area, I settled in a hard plastic chair among the other visitors, mostly family members. The doors opened and the inmates strode to their places. Families jumped up and rushed to their seats and grabbed the phones. Every seat was occupied, except number 17. I walked up to the guard to ask what was up. I had only half an hour with him, and 10 minutes of it was already gone. Where was Dirty Mike? Oh, he said, your guy needs four armed guards to escort him anywhere. We're getting those guards together. You'll get your full half hour. It just won't be at the same time as anyone else. The room cleared out, leaving me alone. Then the door opened and two guards shoved Dirty Mike into his seat at number 17, while another secured the chains around his wrists, waist, and ankles to a metal loop in the floor. Another stood by with a rifle trained on him. They won't let you bring anything into the visiting room, so I had no tape recorder or notepad. I rushed to the stool to take a good look at him, trying to memorize every tattoo, every scar. He was looking over my head, right past me, refusing to look me in the eye, which gave me time to examine all the marks on his face. I counted nine railroad ties on the tattoo Sylvia made across the right side of his face, the one she gave him in Colton. And he had SSC, Southside Colton, inked further down on that side of his neck. FTRA across the top of his chest, slow ride on his knuckles, and he was missing a lot of teeth. He picked up the phone and started yelling at me, really telling me off, but I couldn't hear anything. He'd picked up the wrong phone. I pointed at mine with a sarcastic smile to show him I couldn't hear him. He laughed. The tension was broken. Dirty Mike and I sized each other up through the glass. He picked up the correct phone and asked, Who are you? I'm a writer, I replied. Oh, thank God, he said. There were a few seconds of silence while his eyes looked past me, over the top of my head. I watched Dirty Mike's wheels turning, trying to decide how to use my arrival in the visiting room to his advantage. He knew a writer's weakness. A writer wants a story. When his focus drifted back to me, there was a glint in his eyes. They have me for two murders. They easily could get me for 25. 25 murders? If he was telling the truth, Dirty Mike was the nation's least known serial killer. All because he picked his victims in the place where people go to disappear. The people he killed were drifters. No one was expecting them to show up for work or be home for dinner. In a lot of cases, their families had written them off years ago. As I realized in El Paso, the train yards connect some of the roughest neighborhoods in the country. And the trains are filled with criminals and people on the run. Like Chris Rose told me in New Orleans, you don't know when you're walking down the street if the guy passing you is a serial killer. And that's even more likely if he's covered in train tattoos and chained to the floor across the bulletproof glass from you. Dirty Mike sat there for a sec, calculating what to say next. Then he said, I'm going to spend the rest of my life in jail. All I have left is my story. I'll tell it to you. That's next season on City of the Rails. I mean, we went back with the intention of talking about other murders. Because I'd asked him, you know, are there any others? And he said, we'll talk about that when you come get me. FTRA, they just took whatever from anybody, and they did what they wanted. Those guys were in the shadows. They did everything at night. You know, they scared everybody. Dirty Mike is happier than a pig in shit to know 
that you are going around talking to his ex-traveling partners and his old friends about him. They had all kinds of money. They didn't look like it. These guys were like Hell's Angels. The Hell's Angels were angels in comparison to a lot of the FTRA. The FTRA would have taken you out in a split second. That's next season on City of the Rails. We're at the end of the show, and I wanted to sign off with a heartfelt thank you to this audience. Thanks for letting me lead you headfirst into the darkness. It's been rough at times, scary too, but you stayed with me. You did not look away. As the toxic train wreck in East Palestine shows, people should be paying a lot more attention to the railroads. You are such a diverse group, including many current and former hobos. A lot of people have hopped trains. Even if they only rode for a month or two, living that life of absolute freedom and taking incredible risks is something they'll never forget. And if my voicemail is any indication, those memories got even stronger as they listened to this show. Beyond hobos, just regular folks, school teachers, firefighters, pipe fitters, lawyers even, heard the stories from the train yard and began to re-examine their lives. Sober, responsible citizens started to consider Momo's great question, why do you do what you do? I never expected City of the Rails would bring people together in that way. And shout out to the many moms who have called and written. Moms who see a bit of Ruby in their teenage daughters and are wondering what's coming. Just this week, I got a message from a mom in Texas whose son has been on the rails for 20 years. She's never known how to talk to him about this life. But since she found City of the Rails, all of a sudden, she knows what to ask. I am so proud of that. To all you train moms, mothers of those who rode or are still out there, Nanette thinks we should have a train mom Zoom call, and I'm all for it. If you're into it, leave me a message at the show phone number, 707-653-0339. I also wanted to acknowledge the people who've passed on while I've been researching the rails. In this season, we've lost two, Byron York, who survived the squat fire, and Josh Brack, who told me Colton was the capital city for hobos. As for what's next, don't unsubscribe to the show feed. We're planning some great bonus episodes. Inspired by Nikita, we're collecting road dog stories. So leave them at 707-653-0339. Also, I've been working with ProPublica, the investigative journalism nonprofit, on a series of stories about the rails. So workers, engineers, conductors, carmen, and the Brotherhood of Maintenance of Way, I want to talk to you. 707-653-0339. Stay tuned, because there are a million stories waiting to be told in the city of the rails. We've heard great things from you about the music. Many new followers of my Modern Hobo playlist and new fans of the band that plays our theme song, Profane Sass. And we're excited to announce that our composer, Aaron Kaufman, is releasing an album entitled The Yard, Songs Inspired by City of the Rails. You can find it on Spotify and all major streaming platforms or by using the link in our show notes. City of the Rails is hosted and written by me, Danelle Morton, and developed in partnership between Flipturn Studios and iHeart Podcasts. If you want to follow along, find us on Instagram at Flipturn Pods. I'll be posting more too at Danelle Ryder. Our production team is executive producer and showrunner Julian Weller. Julian also produced our trips to El Paso and Colton, sound directed, edited, and mixed the show. Our executive producer at Flipturn is Mark Healy, senior producer Abu Zafar, producers and Lady Squad. Zoe Denkla, Emily Marinoff, Sheena Ozaki, Jackie Huntington, Trisha Mukherjee, and Jessica Kreinchich. 
with production support from Marcy DePina. We had a very modular team making this show, and many people pitched in to make it sound as good as it does. A special shout out to three people who were here for the whole ride. Zoe Denkla, who was at the other end of the Zoom for every recording, battling with me over the script, always with the goal of making it authentic and easier for listeners to understand. She made great contributions in story discussions and in episode edits, too. And Julian Weller assembled the great team I've gotten to work with, sound directed, edited, and mixed the show. And more than that, drove through the Texas desert with me and snuck into Southside Colton Yard to record train sounds. Plus, struggled through 18 months working with a very demanding host. And best of all, my business partner, Mark Healy, who two years ago convinced me we should make a podcast when I thought that was the craziest thing in the world. You were right, Mark. It's working so far, but if it all goes horribly wrong, we can just blame Jamie Kitman for introducing us. You still owe me that Manhattan. Original music every episode by Aaron Kaufman. Our theme music is Wayfaring Stranger, performed by Profane Sass. Thanks to Scott Michaud at Flail Records. Our logo is by Lucy Quintanilla and uses a photograph by Mike Brody. And at iHeart, thanks to Nikki Etor and Beth Ann Macaluso. We'll see you again in the city of the rails. Hey, Danielle, look, um, just thought I'd give you a ring from um, Australia where I've been listening to this fantastic story of yours and your beautiful writing. I've, I've enjoyed it enormously. and um, it, it reminds me so much of the time when I was on the road in America playing music on the streets and seeing some of those musicians and the kids out there playing and busking reminded me so much of, of my years traveling and, and being on and off trains. I just wanted to say how much I've enjoyed it and, and how so many memories have sort of come flooding back of, of these times. Anyway, I thought I'd just play you um, one of the songs that I used to play a lot when I was, uh, when I was around. Anyway, here it goes. Hi guys, Nancy Grace here, host of podcast Crime Stories with Nancy Grace. I've dedicated my life to fighting crime and helping crime victims. For a decade, I prosecuted violent felonies. Every day is a mission. Every day is a chance to stop crime and keep one more person safe. Listen to Crime Stories with Nancy Grace on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcast.